we opened the bag now. We're going to publicize everybody this awesome niche. Yeah. <laughs> Don't well, do it. Ricky Howard here with DOD Contract Academy, dodcontract.com. And today I am with Eitan. Eitan, how are you today? Hi, Rick. I'm doing great. How about yourself? Good, good. So today we're doing something a little bit different. I've been working with Eitan a little bit about starting selling to the federal government. So he already has a business. We're not going to get into that, but what we are going to talk about is, you know, where the best place to start is because, you know, he's involved in a few different areas. He has access to a few different companies, but, you know, if you're listening to the podcast or been on our blog website, you know, we're a big proponent of looking and seeing what the federal government is doing spending wise before we start actually trying to sell to the government. So, um, and that's very important because, you may just have to pivot a little bit to really hit on a government need. So doing some of this research ahead of time is very important. So what Aitan and I are going to do today is we're going to talk about some of his ideas and we're going to look at the federal spending and we're going to start making maybe a list of what we think is going to be some of the best places to start. So how does that sound, Aitan? Sounds awesome. Looking forward to it. Good. All right. So first, why don't we talk a little bit? I know you, we've uh, we've talked, we've exchanged some emails, but why don't you give kind of a, a brief, like, hey, here are some of the ideas that you're thinking about? Because as we reverse engineer it, we're going to have to start with something and st we'll start analyzing where the spending is. Right. So I think we, during our exchanges, we spoke about um, originally uh, call center services, um, we have uh, access to different companies that offer those kind of uh, customer relation services, whether it's for appointment setting, uh, text reports, customer service, that kind of things. Right. Um, we talk about a contact with a manufacturing business, plastic uh, bags manufacturing based out of the U.S. Uh, we talk about uh, painting, literally uh, painting services, uh, you know, painting houses, military mm -hmm. bases, whatever yep. that may be. Um, so we had a lot, I have a lot of different contacts. So the, the idea of, of this meeting was really to see, uh, do some kind of reverse engineering and see if we can come up with what's the best thing, most efficient um, that the government is currently looking for and try yeah. to uh, get for them. Yeah, no, I uh, I like this approach. And this is this is something that we'll do with other businesses as well. Um, a lot of times it will be something that they specialize in and we just need to figure out, hey, like, but I use cybersecurity companies all the time because it's, I get a lot of them coming through. And the key with them is, hey, let's really pick an area within that huge topic, that huge mm -hmm. industry that's going to make sense for you. It's a very, that, by the way, is a very competitive uh, industry you know, to be in if you're selling to the government. So, as far as some of the things that we talked about, I, was discouraging you from focusing on products. Um, so I, I like to put those, aside. when I say products, just for everyone listening, I'm talking about, you know, low dollar products, you know, things like office supplies or, and I'm not saying that none of the, like the plastic bags, those things may be able to work, but we're usually talking about a low margin of error or low margin of profit, um, potential bidding wars. Um, and, and there's a different way of selling products too. So, I do like to focus on, you know, services, technologies, those type of things. I, I think they they resonate a little bit more. And, you know, the way that I see as a productive way of selling to the government and making money for small businesses, it seems like that is a better um, path forward. And so that doesn't apply to high dollar products. Like if you're selling right. high high dollar medical equipment or you're selling, you know, uh, software licenses, or you're selling, you know, you you name it. The, the higher dollar stuff, especially if it's unique, that's that's a little bit different. But if we're talking about kind of commodities, I guess is a better way to put it. Um, mm -hmm. Typically, I like to stay away from those type of things, especially when we're starting out. Um, so if you're okay with that, then I'm okay with that. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Okay, cool. So I'm going to share my. If I share my screen, you're going to be able to see what I'm looking at. Should be able to. Okay, hopefully. All right. So yeah, what? Perfect. So what I'm going to start off with is we're going to look at, and I've got another computer over here. I have a couple other systems on. I use a variety of paid for tools to do some of my searches. So I'm going to start off by looking, and what I like to look at is federal spending history when I'm trying to decide something like this. So 
Um, it's a little more inaccurate if you're just looking at opportunities, right? So, you know, let's say that we were looking at call center opportunities and we had, you know, over the next six months, we saw, hey, there's, you know, $200 million in call center opportunities coming out. But then we look in the federal sales history and we see, well, hey, the government's only spent $250 million in call center contracts. So this isn't true, but over the past five years, well, then we know, hey, maybe there's a a mismatch there. So if we look over the past three to five years, we we get a good sense of what the government's spending and hey, is that going to be consistent over the years? Mm-hmm. Let's start with call center since you mentioned it. Um, mm-hmm. So what I am well, doing... Just, well, you just mentioned, could that be because um, there, there's a need, but that hasn't been fulfilled? It could be for a lot of reasons. It could be, there are some, there are some things that the, gov- like the government buys almost everything, right? But Mm-hmm. there are there are limitations to that right and i'll just use a, an example um of uh i think it was the government hired someone uh was involved with piano lessons and like performing like songs mm-hmm. on the piano and mm-hmm. uh you know and so the government we'd certainly found contracts where the government hired people to play piano at a event we found like twenty thousand oh, right. contracts okay but you know if i let's say i was looking for an opportunity and for piano and i saw hey there's a you know, twenty forty thousand dollar opportunity here next week in piano. If we based uh, for like to perform it, I don't know a retirement ceremony or something. If we saw that and we based your business to the government off of that, we would have missed the fact that the government hasn't purchased any of it in the past three years. So that's kind of a mm-hmm. one off. So there's some things mm-hmm. the government buys, but it's only now and then, or it's not going to be enough to sustain you. Um, mm-hmm. you know, over time. So that's really what I mean by that. We want to make sure the government's buying it and they're buying enough of it where a small business and from small businesses. So a small business can um, jump in there and make that work. Got so it. now what I'm looking at right now are product service codes. This is a this is one way the government classifies contracts. It's usually a more specific way than a NAICS code. That would be a North American industry classification mm-hmm. code. There's a lot of different ways to search for opportunities. I can also search by keyword, um, but I find these codes, although not perfect, give us a, a good sense of um, potentially what we're looking at. So when we're talking about help desk, like you can see here, this particular help desk code is specific to IT and telecom. Is that something like when you say help desk services or call center services, is there a specific like industry or a kind nope, of could, more general? Nope. If I to, if I had to give very uh, broad categories quickly, is um, there would be answering services uh, that would include customer service, could be IT, could be uh, tech support, um, okay. could be uh, appointment appointments, uh, booking and settings. Um, yeah, this is for uh, computing, including help desk service, uh, desk side support, workspace technical support, audio audio video conferencing, printer support. So it looks like a lot that it would have to do with kind of IT or personal workspace, yeah. talk conference room and whatnot. Now we can see that over the past three years, the government spent $1.6 billion in this. Particular, just on that. Just on that, right? So on, on, on that, on in the field, on that particular job there? On this, like as I described, help desk services. So this is, for anybody that's wondering what I'm looking at, this is, um, a product service code, and the code is DE01, Delta Echo 01, IT and telecom. Mm-hmm. And so this is showing me how much, and basically, by the way, like any tool you pay for, I use a lot of different ones. Any tool you pay for is taking the information from the public, um, you know, the government websites that are free for everyone to use. So you can go to a website like usaspending.gov or fpds sam.gov that's where the the public repository is because federal spending is public and the government has to report its spending there's some stuff that's not going to be reported because it's classified um but then i will also say in the same breath this is the government right and there's so many different there's thousands of different offices out there making purchases so they're all different. So some of them are good about reporting. Some of them, there's going to be a lag. So I always assume, and they'll even tell you, hey, assume a six-month lag in reporting. And then this number, these numbers are going to change. So you, if you look at anything up as far as federal spending, especially big picture stuff, if you look at it the next week, that number is going to be different. And it could go up or down. So it just, but we're trying to get the big picture. So that's a, that's a pretty nice baseline. <laughs> yeah. So if you see 1.6 billion, you know they're spending. If this number was 
20 million over the past three years, I'd say we're probably in the wrong place, right? Because that's not mm -hmm. a lot of money for the government to be spending, especially over three to five years. Okay, so that's the first thing. The next thing I want to get a sense of, you know, how does the government make those purchases? 1.6 billion. I can see that roughly a third of that is going through GSA. Do you know what GSA is? Uh, nope, I forgot. I knew that the government, um, small administration. It's just a way that the government, just think of it this way. The government can't make purchases the way you or I do. Um, they have to, and this is where the federal acquisitions regulations come in, right? So the federal acquisitions regulations, just thousands of pages that can make this complicated, right? So um, that's why we want to focus and we only want, like for you as a small business owner, I just want you to have to understand the piece that applies to you. Um, mm -hmm. Now, having said that, the government can't just put anyone on contract because they want to. There has to be a way or a mechanism to put them on contract. They can compete something. They can have an open competition where everybody bids on it. Um, they can use something that I loosely would throw GSA um, and other contract vehicles into something called category management. And category management, because competing something takes a long time. Right. So as when I was a program manager, if I had to put a company on contract to do help help desk services, right? So I know that I'm going to have, if that was like the program I was running, I would know that I probably have several contracts and tons of different efforts related to help desk that I had to put on contract. And a lot of them I wouldn't even know or were coming over the next three years. And I definitely did not want to have to compete every opportunity and spend a year putting a solicitation out there and competing it and, and making an award mm -hmm. like every time I had to do that. So one way the government gets around that is they will have either these contract vehicles, GSA, I'll talk about GSA in a second, where you know maybe your company and a hundred other companies will, we'll call it the Ricky Howard contract vehicle. You all apply to be on the Ricky Howard help desk contract vehicle. And then and just like you were sending a proposal in on a solicitation, and then we would have a board. We would it would probably take a year to get through them all, um, and then we would whittle it down to maybe ten companies, right? Uh, that were going to be on the Ricky Howard contract vehicle. Now, once you're on this contract, you don't necessarily make any money, right? So all that means is that I can now go to your company. I don't have to have a competition. I can go to your company and put help desk delivery orders on your company through that contract vehicle. And usually there's a ceiling, so it might have a ceiling of say. A uh, hundred million dollars, right? Um, it doesn't mean you're going to make a hundred million dollars, but it means that I have a hundred million dollars of ceiling on there to put any of those companies on contract when I need them, when I have funds, and when I have a requirement. So, hopefully, that's not too confusing. But I want to understand if those type of things are in place and how much they're being used, because that could make it difficult for a company that's not on those contract vehicles to compete. Um, so, you mean to say that if there are already companies under that GSA? then it would be too difficult to now compete and get into the picture? GSA is a little bit different because now GSA is a, you can apply to be on GSA. Um, okay. for, for most of the GSA, the, like the multiple award schedule, for the most part, you can put an application in and G, it takes about six months, I would plan on, where you know they're going to review your pricing, your past performance, and then eventually you get put on the GSA schedule and G now the government can buy your stuff through GSA. Um, now, a lot of companies have come to me, some, a lot of companies have been frustrated because they go out and they get a GSA schedule thinking they're just going to win a bunch of work and they never, and they don't. It doesn't work quite like that. It just gives the government a way to get to you. So first thing I want to know is how much is it being used, right? So in this case, I can see that roughly, roughly a third of that 1.6 billion is going through GSA. Um, mm -hmm. what that means for you is you don't need to be on GSA, right? And, and I don't, and I don't, I very rarely recommend a company try to go get a GSA schedule before they start selling to the government. Only if it's a industry where like 70% of the purchases are made that way, that's where you really need to start thinking, Hey, this, this is probably what I need to do because you also have a quota, right? If you're on GSA, they expect you to pull in. I don't know what the min is right now. It's like 25 or 30 grand a year or something, but you have to be able to sell on that schedule and they have requirements. Um, and it's a pain to get it. I mean, it's once you have it, it's good. And you know, this, like for this, I would say, Hey, right now, like a recommendation would be, Hey, we can start selling this type of thing. 
you don't need GSA right away. But once you start making some progress and we start getting you into some agencies, if if the customers that you're targeting like to use GSA, at that point, you can start the application process mm-hmm. and you get on there. Because uh, there's also plenty of companies that have a GSA contract that you can partner with and go after that. That's so, interesting. Yeah. Okay. So um, just a little bit on GSA. So 1.6 billion. So not a small amount, right? And and by the way, we can look. There's other ways. To, uh, I don't want to make this um, agnosium here, but here are some other larger contract vehicles that we can see. Um, like I was describing, um, this is NASA Soup. Um, this is uh, let's see, CIO SP3 is another. See, these are big, um, big contract vehicles that have been competed, and there's a lot of businesses on there. And um, when you're on there, the government can use those to put companies on contract. But I wouldn't worry about that for now. If uh, if we find an opportunity for you and you want to sell something like this, you can partner with a company that is on one of those vehicles. Okay. okay. And by the way, this is for labor. It says labor right there. So I'm guessing that this is going to be a lot of providing people to do the work. Is that something you'd be interested in? Yes, we have this. We have we have a couple hundred uh, employees who are behind the phones. Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, so now we want to take a look at who are you selling to? Who is actually doing the spending? Because you don't want to focus on all of the federal government. It's a huge place. So we can see here. There's a breakdown that shows us kind of the top three, four five agencies that are going to be involved. And they usually, we can break out the DOD into the separate services. So Department of Treasury and Homeland Security are at the top or the top two. And then the next uh, are going to be all Department of Defense, Navy, Army, and Air Force. So it gives us an idea of who your targets are going to be. Now that can change, you know, depending on how your company's set up. Um, mm-hmm. Do you know, is so with the small business that's registered and selling here, would they be woman-owned or potentially 8A or hub zone? Um, no, no. It would be, okay. it would be all, inclusive, all inclusive, I was a little bit, not, uh, not a minority or anything like that. Right. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. So it gives us an idea of who's doing the, the spending. Now I want to know, because you are a small business, so I, I want to have an idea of... Is there any difference in how these are competed, if they're set aside? We can see that full and open competition is 22, or sorry, full and open 61%, another 20% full and open competition after exclusion of sources. So that's about 81% you know is going to be competed. What this means, full and open after exclusion of sources, that just means that, or it could mean that um, the government says, hey, I'm going to set this aside for a small business or an 8A, or I'm going to exclude, I'm going to use some way to exclude other sources. And then I'm going to compete those, um, the solicitation amongst those businesses. So mm-hmm. um, that's that's what that means. Do you have questions about that? So, I mean, the, the full open competition after exclusion of sources. So that's something that would be good for me, I guess. Potentially, so yeah. Company. Potentially. And, and what I really like to see is here this uh, where it says not competed, not available for competition, uh, not competed under SAP, uh, competed under SAP. What that means is because with any small business, my recommendation is I want to be able to get in before a solicitation comes out and try to sell. Mm, that way, okay. Right? So here, what this tells me is there's going to potentially be um, you know, simplified acquisitions is a way of putting small businesses on contract. And typically you're doing that without a open competition, right? So that's where we find about an opportunity ahead of time. And we are influencing the government, like influencing the potential solicitation. But, you know, there are a lot of sole source contracts out there. And, and this is one of the ways those happen. So, nice. yeah, nice. so we could see that the opportunity potentially for sole source is there. Let's look at set aside. So this is not necessarily how they're awarded, but this is, you know, before when the solicitation goes out, is there a set aside used like small business, like 8A? So we could see 61% of these roughly no set aside was set in the beginning. And then the rest, obviously, there's about 40% remaining do have set asides. 8A, 8A is like the certification to get if you can get it. Um, what does it stand for? 
A day is a, I mean, I, I don't have it right in front of me, but it's basically if you are a minority owned business, that is you, there's usually a financial piece to it as well. Meaning, um, you know, you've been disenfranchised in some way. Um, there's a variety of parameters and um, I can show you, you go to the small business associate SBA website and SBA website is going to give you all of the parameters there. You can look it up. Um, you know, some of them are, oh, it's not letting me do that. Uh, some of the parameters are going to be like how much you make each year, or what is your total total value, uh, not including your house of assets that you own. So there's going to be those type of questions, but you can go through the list of parameters and see if you meet those. And if you do, you could potentially put in a, an 8A application. But what, what's great about 8A is 8A has language in there that allows the government to give you a sole source contract. Sole source contracts are typically not easy to get. But 8A makes it a lot easier. And there's there's ways that we work with uh, businesses to make that a little bit easier. Okay. So yeah, and for everyone not watching this, we're just looking at kind of like a list of the different certifications and set-asides used from 8A to service-disabled, veteran-owned, small business, et cetera. But something else we can do, we can split that up by the major agency. So I can see, all right, well, what does the Department of Treasury, how do they award? Right? Is it is it going to be different than the government at large? And of course, it's going to be. So basically, what I'm saying is, hey, do are any of these agencies better to sell to than others? That, that, mm, so that will show you which ones to approach. Yeah, I mean, it's just this is just a. I mean, like at the end of the day, it's all about relationships and how you find opportunities and influence. But this is just giving us an idea of, hey, are there. Looking at the spending, is are there some agencies that are going to is in this category? Do we see more small business awards? Do we see a lot of set asides up front? Just gives us an idea. And especially if you like, if you did tell me, hey, we're 8A, you know, I would be looking for the agencies that use 8A more than others. You know, SDVOSB is a service disabled veteran owned small business. They are going to, like I can tell you, in almost every case, the VA is going to use that more than the other agencies. See, the Navy, or sorry, the Army uses 8A sole source for 30% of these purchases, right? Yeah, big big chunk. So you can see that, you know, looking through the data is extremely important when you're trying to decide who you're selling to and what you want to do. Because if you were 8A, right, so this would tell me even though the army is not the top purchaser of these services, they certainly use this set aside more than the others, at least, at least percentage wise. So it just gives us a, an idea. And now I'm just looking through, these are different federal contract awards. So, you know, if you had the time, you could go through and start looking at, Hey, what are the types of thing, uh, contracts that have actually been awarded through here. And you might get, you know, in the first line of these contracts, you might get a little bit of information that, uh, you know, so you can kind of glean, hey, what are these, what kind of work would these guys actually have to be doing? So service and maintenance for camera systems sounds a little bit different than kind of the initial description. Copier lease and maintenance. Looks like a lot of maintenance contracts. Application support uh, service desk. That's a little bit more in line with like the actual description of the, the PSC code. Do those sound like things that? I'm not sure. Actually. Yeah. So that's why it's important to kind of look through this and dig into it. Managing printing services. They all sound more like tech support. Yeah. So this is interesting. So they have a security assessment and vulnerability mitigation service, which is more of a cybersecurity, I would say, requirement. That's coming out under this product service code, but it, I guess it's under IT and telecom. So we're seeing a lot of that too. Mm-hmm. Right. So I wonder if there's a better description to what we're looking for. Yeah, probably. Um, and again, with the, with the codes, you're going to get a lot of different things. I mean, that's just the way it is. It's not that specific. And if we were in a NAICS code, it would be even larger, right? So yeah. So I mean, it looks like some. There's going to be some things in here that maybe have help desk, but have a lot of other things kind of lumped in there. Let's take a look at a couple of the others. So now for everyone listening, we're looking at a NAICS code, N-A-I-C-S code for telemarketing bureaus and other contact centers. It says here, it gives a description. So in different examples, so customer service call centers, order taking for clients over the internet. That's much more in line. Okay. 
All right. And the spending's higher too. Of course, this is broad. Wow. This, these are a little broader too. So just so you know, it's also going to have a lot of different things in there. Some of them you'll probably resonate with and some of them you won't. So this one, $3.4 billion in spending over the past uh, few years. We go to scheduling uh, schedules here and um, uh, looks just I'm just looking at different contract vehicles being used. So this is good. A little bit coming through GSA, but it's less than a third. It's probably, let's see, probably 20% ish going through GSA. So you don't need, you don't need a GSA contract. Again, that's one of those things you want to determine up front because you don't want to have to get that. You want to start selling first. And look, like be look at this huge uh segment here. So Department of Health and Human Services is doing 81% of the spending. Wow. So 81% of that number, that's a, a huge part of that. And now, and there aren't a lot of companies that they're oh, selling to. Yeah. So you've got a, probably a big company right here. And General Dynamics is a huge company. And you get a bunch of other ones right here. So this makes me wonder how much actually is going to small businesses. So no set aside used for 84%. But um, again, that's, I believe, just for the solicitations. Can you still hear me? Yep. I'm going to use another tool that's not on the screen. And I'm going to look at the actual contract awards. So for anyone listening, what now? You can, There's a lot of different tools and systems that you can use. Uh, like I said, USA Spending, FPDS are free. You can use GovTribe, GovWinIQ. You can use bid search. There's different bid matching tools and things that you can use to and by the way different tools are good at you know some tools are great at some things and really poor <laughs> at, at others so kind of got to play with them to figure out you know which ones work for you depending on the type of research that you're trying to do so what i'm going to do now i'm going to take this NAICS code and i'm just going to look for the awarded contracts and i'm going to try to sort through the ones that were just awarded to small businesses. And there's some other NAICS codes too, like for telephone answering services and whatnot. Interesting. So of the 3.4 billion that we're seeing, hold on, actually, let me go back here. I don't think I have the right numbers here. Most of this is going to go to large businesses though. I'll take 1%. I'll be happy with that. Yeah. <laughs> it's all you need, right? <laughs> Yeah, so I'm showing about 164 million of that, of that 3.4 billion. Again, these numbers are going to change there, but that's, it, but for the most part, I, right? I can't do that. It's less than one percent. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, how about 164 million? And keep in mind too, that's, that's over a half a point. That's over years, right? So um, that's over the past, you know, three to five years. FY 23, fiscal year 23, nothing's going to be reported. And FY 22, the government fiscal year starts October 1st and ends at the end of September. So I expect the FY 22 numbers to be still updating all, all through this fiscal year, uh, personally. Okay. So that's interesting. I, I want to, because I did see that there is a just, because would you be, telephone answering services was another. Yeah, yeah. Telephone answering services, uh, we'd even say a virtual assistant. It's all related to the call center. Yeah, but telephone services, definitely. Answering services. So what's interesting about this, so I'm looking at telephone answering services over the past three to five years, and it's 414 million. But the average number of offers received is very, very low, like three Ooh, offers is what I'm seeing. And that's, again, it, that's a, that's a good sign, right? That is a good sign. That is a good sign. And I'm going to go back and I'm going to check the other NAICS code as well. That basically says that's not too comp comp competitive, right? Yeah. Well, just to give you, just to put it in context, if like I was looking at cybersecurity services the other day, and it was between 50 and 75 solicitations, or 50 and 75 proposals would come in for each solicitation. Yeah. Oh, here, listen to this, right? So the... The last code that we were looking on, the, um, God, what was that? Two, two. Uh, 422. 422. 422. 422. Average number of offers received, 204. Oh, wow. Got it. So, I mean, so think about that, right? Now we're on telephone answering services. The money's not as much, but you know there's way fewer 
um, solicitations coming in. And by yeah. the way, I don't I don't have like extremely high confidence in any system's ability to tell me how many offers are coming in. Um, you think it's not accurate? I don't. I think it's it depends on what's being reported, right? And right. I think I think some agencies are good at reporting and some aren't. And by the way, there's also mm-hmm. you know for anything in here that wasn't competed then mm-hmm. like look at this anything that's not competed there are no so you know the the only proposal they're getting is the proposal from the company that is uh um that they're actually buying from and they might just be giving them a quote right because there's no so you're going to see everything in here but there's a ton of this is amazing actually not available for competition 261 million dollars for telephone answering services which which just tells me and so this could be this relationships could, already built from the get-go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, your relationships, you respond to RFIs and sources sought, you're establishing, you're finding those opportunities ahead of time and you're winning. Or maybe you're mm-hmm. you know, you're also probably I would imagine a lot of this is going to be rolled up into larger contracts as well with a prime mm-hmm. who needs telephone answering services, right? So I think what I've seen so far, I think this is going to be a great area. Oh, cool. So telephone answering services. I, I think this is a winner. Hopefully this was provided some uh, benefit and value to you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Good stuff. All right. Sounds good. So for everyone listening, hopefully this provided value, just going through the drill of looking at research and data. Hopefully we didn't bore you here, but I think me and Aiton, <laughs> we found a winner uh, based on how they're actually um, putting some of this work on contract what types of companies they're uh, putting it on contract with. So it's not, they're not, it's not, it's not billions of dollars, but where they're putting contracts uh, on small businesses and there is not a lot of competition. So what that, there's a lot more research to be done here, but what this tells me is it's a good niche to do, uh, to further investigate. So again, this is just the starting point and, you know, we'll uh, take this up again next time. Thank you, Rick.